We are going to now move into the radicals, and I'm going to define generally what a radical is, and then specifically the one we deal with in Algebra 1. Now the radical you know is the square root, but then you also have the nth root, um, like you can have a cube root, a fourth root, a fifth root, you can have fractional roots, you can have pi root if you want to. And the way we write those is with little index inside the little check of the square root. Now we don't write the two for the square root because notation means it's understood. It's sort of like a phantom two. We don't put it there if we don't need it. Now what these radicals really are, it's they're really exponents. And they're really fractional exponents. So a square root is the same thing as raising something to the one half power. And the nth root is the same thing as raising something to the one over n power. And in Algebra 1, we pretty much exclusively deal with the square root because the highest exponent we deal with in functions is usually the quadratic. And to undo quadratics, you need to square root things. So the definition of a square root is this. If a squared equals b, then a is the square root of b. So case in point, 6 squared equals 36 and negative 6 squared equals 36. Therefore, 6 and negative 6 are both square roots of 36. And because the square roots have two versions, um, we have to give a name to everything. And so there are two versions of square roots. Actually, any of the even ones, like 2, 4, 6, 8, have this same sort of property where there are two versions of the radical. If it's an odd power like cube root, there's only actually one. So for square roots and other even roots, we have one root which is called the principal root. That's the word we use for the positive version. And you'll know you need the positive root when you either see a plus sign in front of it or no sign at all. That's an indication that I want the positive root. So if you see the square root of 121, I'm telling you I want this positive version of the square root of 121, which is just 11. Now, one thing we have to be super careful with is when you see a variable underneath the square root, this is not just an m. Because I'm asking for the positive root, I have to make sure that when I square root this quantity, I get a negative number out. And if m were like negative 3 and I just wrote m there, that's actually not true. So when I put a variable underneath the radical and ask you to take the square root of it, it has to have absolute value symbols around it. And that is to ensure that you get the positive. So you have to ensure that the number is positive. And the only way to do that is to take the absolute value and get rid of the sign. And that's the only thing you have to be careful with with uh, square roots is that if I put a variable in there, I take it out, you got to put some absolute values around it. Now the other version of the root is the negative root. And when I want the negative root, you're actually going to see the negative sign out in front of it. And so if I see negative square root of 81, that means I want negative 9. And in the case of the variable, I have to ensure that it's negative. And so I'm going to do something similar with this one. So to make sure that it is negative, I do the absolute value of m like I did before. But I put the negative sign out front to make sure that that number is negative. So this is to ensure number is negative. And once again, that's the thing you have to be careful with, um, with the variables inside the radical. Now, be super careful with where I place the negative signs. If I put the negative sign underneath the radical, that means something entirely different. As a matter of fact, it means that I don't even have a real number because there is no number that when I multiply it by itself, I get a negative 81. I either can be positive or I can be negative. It's not like I have a sign that's like halfway negative. So a halfway negative number times a halfway negative number is a full negative number. It doesn't work that way. So if I put the negative sign underneath the radical, what you need to tell me is that it's not a real number. Now, in a little bit, I'll, I'll address what that actually is. But right now, it's not a real number. All right, now sometimes the notation will ask you to give me both the positive and negative roots. Or sometimes you have to indicate that you're taking both. And you just use the plus or minus sign out in front. 
And one of our most famous formulas in Algebra 1, something called the quadratic formula, has a plus or minus in it. So plus or minus the square root of 144 means I want both positive 12 and negative 12. So you can just put it with the plus or minus in front to indicate that you have both. Same thing here. I need to indicate that I want both versions, positive and negative. Now here is the most confused thing with radicals. Um, at least it is in my Algebra 2 class. It's an issue with notation. Now, if I ask you to simplify, like these examples and every example I've given you before, the square root's given to you. So I give you that it's positive or I give you that it's negative, and you just have to follow the notation. Now, if you introduce the square root into the problem, meaning it wasn't there to begin with, but you chose to put it into the problem, and this usually happens when you're solving, then you have to add the plus or minus. Because remember, numbers like 25 have two square roots. You have a positive version and a negative version. So if I ask you to solve x squared equals 25, and you choose, hey, I want to square root both sides. So if you choose to introduce the square root to the problem, you have to remember to put the plus or minus in there. And so what you end up with is x is equal to 5, or it's equal to negative 5. It's two answers. And if you forget that, you only get one. And if you are solving quadratics and you only give me one of the two answers, well, your solution is only halfway correct. So if you put it into a problem, you have to put the plus or minus. If it's already given to you in the problem, like it's simplify, then just follow whatever the notation says. Just be very careful. You want the positive, negative, or both. But if you have to put it into the problem, if you're solving, then don't forget the plus or minus, or you will literally lose half your solution set. As I said earlier, you have to be careful where the negative is placed. So if the negative is outside, it's a square, it's a negative square root of 64, which is negative 8. If I put the negative inside the radical, it's no longer a real number. Actually, it's an imaginary number. And I am okay with you just saying that it's not real. But if you want to get fancy and put it down what it really is. Um, what you do is you take the square root of the 64 and you put a little i next to it and that i represents the square root of negative 1. Now, be careful. Uh, you don't know a lot about imaginary numbers and it's safest just to say that this thing is not real. Okay. Now with square roots come these things called perfect squares and it actually makes your life a lot easier if you just know the first 25 perfect squares and you probably know the first 12 because you probably had to learn your multiplication tables up to 12 and so they are the first 11 are 1 4 9 16 25 36 49 64 81 100 and 121 these are really good to know because if I put them in a simplify radical problem you immediately recognize them and know that they're perfect squares when we have to simplify radicals, it's good to recognize them, as you'll see. And then when we have to do this thing called factoring, it's really nice to know them as well because you can actually, you know, factor pretty quickly. Uh, one little note about these, um, you get to use a calculator in just about everything we do for algebra. But every once in a while, like on a seventh grade star test, you actually can't use a calculator. And if you need to approximate the value of a square root, and you don't have a calculator, so you kind of need to know, hey, what's the square root of 5, right? And I don't know what that is as a decimal because it's not a perfect square. Well, the square root of 4, square root of 5, square root of 6, square root of 7, square root of 8, and square root of 9, I know the square root of 4 is 2, and I know this thing is 3. So all of these radicals are going to be 2 point something. And up to about one or two decimal places, and later on, you know, three or four decimal places, um, these square roots are broken up into almost even intervals. So if you want an approximation, um, you can look at this as one jump, two jumps, three jumps, four jumps, five jumps. So if you break this interval up into five, so between two and three into fifths, this should be about 2.2. This is going to be about 2.4. This is going to be about 2.6 and that's going to be about 2.8. Remember, these numbers are irrational numbers, meaning their decimals don't repeat, they don't ever end, they go on forever and ever, 
And these are just approximations. So if you have to do a quick calculation without a calculator just to see if an answer makes sense, you can kind of use those values. And let's just double check. I'll show you. Square root of 5 is about 2 point is about 2.2. Square root of 6 is about 2.4. Square root of 7 is about 2.6. And the square root of 8 is about 2.8. So a couple of notes, square root of 0 is 0, square root of 1 is 1, square root of negative 1 is i, which means it's not real. And so now just to do a quick check to make sure you understand the notation, I want you to simplify each of those expressions.